welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. I look forward to spending uh, the next few days with you, and I hope that all of you will gain a rich blessing as we study God's Word together. Uh, we're going to be looking at the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. The Bible gives us an enormous amount of detail concerning the things that are coming in the future. And we get a lot of uh, general ideas, but there's actually a lot of detail. And I want to share some of the detail with you over the last, or over the next few uh, days, next few meetings. Um, but let's begin with prayer and invite God's presence as we study His Word together. Our Father in Heaven, I want to thank You for the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, which give us a clear understanding of Your will for our lives. And you also give us a very clear understanding of the future. And it means so much to us that you love us and that you have done this so that we may understand and be able to navigate the difficult and unique circumstances that will come upon your people in the last days. So bless us, Father in heaven, with your Holy Spirit as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Perhaps the most well-known part of Scripture that gives us an understanding of the last days is Revelation chapter 13. And I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. These are familiar uh, uh, verses, but they are very, very important. And they give us some very interesting detail uh, about what is coming in the future. Revelation 13. One of the things about Revelation 13 is that it is inclusive language. Inclusive because it's referring to either all the people on the earth or none of the people on the earth or in general the kinds of uh, language that it uses is referring to a global concept. So when the Bible talks about the future things, especially as, as it relates to the worship laws in the last days, uh, it's going to give us global language or globalized language. And the New World Order is all about globalization. And we're going to spend some time looking at globalization tonight and over the next few sessions together because uh, it, is, it, it plays such an important part in end time events. So Revelation chapter 13, and I'd like you to just take a note as, a, as we go along of a few of these verses uh, Revelation 13, verse 3, for instance, says that I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And then it says, and what? All that dwell upon the earth, uh, oh, sorry, all the world wondered after the beast. All right, then come over to verse 8. Verse 8 says, and all that dwell upon the earth. You see that inclusive language? We're talking about globalization here. Everyone is included in this, of course, except those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, I would like to point out at this juncture that perhaps getting your name in the Lamb's book of life is the most important project that you can ever take on in your life. The most important thing you can do is get your name in the Lamb's book of life. And that means a lot of things. <laughs> It means a comprehensive experience with Jesus Christ. So when the Bible is talking about the globalization in the last days, it's referring to these uh, verses, um, <clears throat> or rather these verses help us understand that globalization is what to expect in the last days. You know, if you spoke about globalization 30 years ago, you would have been relegated to the fringes of society, to the, to the margins of society uh, as a lunatic or the, or the lunatic fringe or, the, uh, or they might have called you a conspiracy theorist. Have you ever been accused of being a conspiracy theorist? Well, I don't know about you, but I am not ashamed to be a conspiracy theorist. But I want you to understand what I mean. I'm not looking for a conspiracy behind every bush. However, there is one conspiracy that we all must understand, and that is the conspiracy of Satan against God and his people in the last days. He collaborates with various organizations and entities that are uh, here in this earth that fulfill his agenda, and they are working to 
pin you into a corner so that you have no place to go. And you have nothing you can do but succumb to his power if possible. That's why even the very elect will be deceived if it were possible. And fortunately, by the grace of God, the very elect will not be deceived. It's because the Bible gives us the detail. And I'm thankful for the Bible. And I'm also thankful for the spirit of prophecy because the spirit of prophecy gives us an enormous amount of information as well. But also it gives us spiritual guidance for the last days so that we may know how to navigate those unique and difficult circumstances that God's people will face. Well, that's not the end of this. There are other inclusive terms in these verses, but let me point out something. If there is going to be a global worship, which we would call a universal worship, um, perhaps historically we've often called it the universal Sunday law, if there's going to be universal worship or global worship, there must also be another element. You, you cannot have global worship unless you have global political order, a global economic order. In fact, you can even add to that a global educational order and a global military, or at least an enforcement mechanism so that the worship laws in the last days can actually be enforced. So globalization has uh, started and is well on its way. And as I said 30 years ago, people weren't willing to talk about it very much. But today it is front and center. Everywhere you turn, if you pay attention to the news, you will hear globalization coming through here and there on a continual basis. They're all the time talking about the new world order. Well, they may not use that term, but they use terms that are compatible with that. <clears throat> global contracts, global business, global language. We're going to learn a lot about these things uh, over the next few sessions together. Now come down to verse 12. Verse 12 says, He exercises all, there's another all, but that's not exactly referring to globalization. That's referring to all the power of the first beast. That's what, what, what does the first beast represent? That's the papacy. All the power of the first beast. The first beast had power when? That was during the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. Okay, so the first beast had a lot of power. It was a worldwide power, at least with the inhabited world or the then known empire or what was known as the Holy Roman Empire. And we're going to come back to that concept a bit later on <clears throat> because the Holy Roman Empire was a religious and civil power. And that power controlled the consciences of the citizens of the various nations. And it collaborated with the rulers and the kings and the monarchs of the civil government. So he exercises all the power. This is talking about the second beast, which is what, what, uh, uh, what is the definition of the second beast? That's the United States, okay? So the United States exercises all the power of the first beast. In other words, the United States will be a controlling power like it was in the past. And I hear people talk about the United States declining. And there are some stresses and challenges and problems that the United States has. And it will continue to have, especially economic, but there will be other things too. But the United States is destined to grow in power because she will exercise all the power of the first beast. And I, I emphasize the word all because she will have the same attitude, the same spirit, the same controlling spirit. And you may have noticed this in recent times as we've seen various uh, laws come down and uh, be implemented here in the United States <clears throat> and for that matter in other parts of the world. I find it very interesting that in some parts of the world they copy what happens in the United States. And sometimes they even do a better job of it. Australia, for instance, is very good at watching what happens up here, and then over there, they begin to ch change their laws and make them even more refined and even more effective 
than what we have in the United States. Perhaps it's because they have a somewhat more compliant citizenry than you would find in the United States. It, it, it varies, you know, it depends on where you are. And then we come down to verse 15. Verse 15 says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It's a little different concept here, but it's also quite inclusive language. Anyone who does not worship the beast will have the death penalty upon them. Coming back to verse 12, it says, He causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Now, how many is that? Well, that's again inclusive language. Them which dwell therein. This is talking about everyone, of course, except those who have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I hope you have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, brothers and sisters. That is perhaps the one thing that causes me to spend time on my knees so that I can get my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I need to do that every day. There are other things in my life that I need to be on my knees about, but that's the most important one, I think. All right, <clears throat> so we see this inclusive. Now come over to verse 16. It says, He causes how many? All, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So all and no, in verse 17 it says no man. That means it's inclusive. Again, or I suppose it's universally exclusive <laughs> in this case. This is talking about globalization. It is a universal process that has to go on if we're ever going to come to the fulfillment of those predictions that are found in Revelation in various places. Now come over to Revelation 17. Revelation 17 is also a very interesting and well-known passage. And again, I'm going to point out the universality of this whole prophetic scenario. Verses 1 and 2, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. How many? It doesn't say. But it's the kings. So the kings of the earth have been committing fornication, spiritual fornication. They have been engaged with Rome, or the whore, as is, uh, the, the whore describes. You know, let me point out something. The Bible doesn't give us names. The Bible doesn't tell us the Vatican is going to do this. And the Bible doesn't tell us that the President of the United States is going to do that. And it doesn't identify by name. It identifies by description. And I think that's very important. It identifies by description. Description makes it very easy then to understand without the name what the Bible's actually talking about. But it also gives people who want to doubt a way to doubt. You know, it gives people... It, God doesn't force people. He'll, he'll make it all so clear that it's hard to avoid the conclusion, but... He will not force them. So there's always a hook on which to hang the hat of doubt. Now the Bible also gives us uh, descriptions of many things. It's not just this, but the whore is a description representing a woman, which is a church in Bible prophecy, as you know. And so we have a, uh, a, a, a very unrighteous or wicked woman, a very... A uh, compromised woman, and if you study the uh, things that have been going on in the Vatican over the last decade or so, you would know that, of course, this fits the description perfectly with all the blasphemies as well as the immoralities and abominations that are done. 
<clears throat> but it says, The kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I want you to notice that the language is also inclusive. He's not using the word, the revelator doesn't use the word all or none or, or that kind of word, but he uses description which just simply includes all the kings of the earth. And I find it interesting that the kings of the earth are continually making visits to the Vatican en route. And just this, this last weekend, in fact this week on Sunday, um, Raul Castro stopped by the Vatican on his way back from Moscow to thank the Pope for helping um, Cuba to begin its uh, rapprochement with the United States, with it, in its dispute with the United States. You know what he said? He said, if Pope Francis continues in this way, I will come back to praying and come back to the church. And he says, I'm not joking. That's Raul Castro, the brother of Fidel Castro, who was the one who, who established the Communist Party in Cuba back in the 1960s. All right, so now we come over to chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Once again, it says in verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I think it's very interesting that only, was it today or yesterday, President Obama said that we ought to pay attention and uh, follow the Pope Pope Francis and his example. He just said that in the last little while. People everywhere are looking to their leaders and their leaders are pointing them to the Pope. I think that's very interesting. That's very prophetic, isn't it? Yes. It's amazing how much prophecy detail the Bible gives us. And I'm very thankful that the Word of God has given us so much information. Now, Revelation 18, verse 3 says, All the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's, that's inclusive. And it says, And the kings of the earth, again, it's inclusive, have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, tell me something, my friends. Who are the merchants of the earth? We, we, we understand who the kings are. That's, that's relatively easy to grasp. That's the presidents, prime ministers, dictators, monarchs. Uh, well, and then there's little kings. You know, they have territories like governors, um, city governors, we call them uh, mayors. You know, they have territories. Those are little kings. <laughs> but the Bible's referring to the main kings of the earth that rule over the major nations uh, of the world. And they spend their time thinking about how to organize themselves politically to their own advantage. Not necessarily your advantage. To their advantage, you understand. Politics is that way. And uh, I'm going to share with you some things later on about politics and prophecy. And it's not exactly um, easy to, well, let me put it this way. You know, when we talk about politics, we don't talk about politics just because we want to be political. We are to stay out of party politics. Isn't that right? I think it's very important for us to stay out of party politics. In fact, the spirit of prophecy makes this very, very clear. But we do see that politics engages with prophecy. And so it's about prophecy, not about politics. So keep that in mind as we discuss a few of the political things going on in terms of globalization. Because globalization is first and foremost political. All right? The New World Order is primarily political, but it also has economic uh, factors as well as a number of others, as you'll see even tonight. Um, let's come over to uh, Revelation 18, verse 4. It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, 
that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. There's a reason we are to come out. Why? So that we don't partake of her sins. Association with Rome means that you will partake of her sins. That is a biblical reality. You cannot escape it. If you are involved in the ecumenical relationships, then you will also be involved in her sins. It will compromise you. And if you're paying attention to the ecumenical movement these days, you'll see that there's a lot of religious leaders that have been making journeys to Rome in recent times. We'll talk about that a little later on. But the ecumenical movement leads into sin. Then it has the corresponding plagues that go with it. So if you want to avoid those things, you've got to come out. That is the message that God's people must give to the whole world uh, once uh, or at the end time. Now come over to Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23. We're covering a few basics here and some things that are familiar, but I want you to understand very clearly this biblical principle of globalization or the biblical revelation of the new world order. Isaiah 23, and we'll look at verse 8. Isaiah 23, verse 8. This is another verse that has to do with uh, spiritual Babylon or spiritual Tyre in the last days, referring to the papacy once again. Verse 8 says, Who hath taken counsel against Tyre, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traffickers are the honorable of the earth? Whose traffickers are the honorable? Who are the honorable of the earth? Well, again, that's the presidents, prime ministers, bankers, central bankers. See, if you're going to have economic um, globalization, you're going to have to have some way of controlling it. And that's what central banks are all about. They control the economy of nations. So when the Bible talks about merchants, they are trafficking. <laughs> what are they trafficking? Well, actually, the Bible tells us that it's more than just central bankers. If you come over to Revelation chapter 18 once again, real quickly, I just want to show you this in uh, verse eight, uh, verse, or chapter 18, verse um, 12. Uh, it's talking about the merchandise that nobody won't buy anymore after Rome has been punished or while Rome is being punished. It says in verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones. That's money, at least and of pearls, and fine linen, and purple, and silk, and scarlet, and all fine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and the souls of men. What a list of the things the merchants of the earth are trafficking. So it's business and commerce and trade, you see. That's what trafficking is, really, is trade. Trade and commerce. And I'm going to point out something about this. As globalization unfolds, trade and commerce is actually at its foundation. The globalization process always begins with trade agreements. You'll see that a bit later on. Just laying some foundation here for you. So we have all these honorable people. We have the political leaders and we have the economic leaders, major multinational corporations, bankers, and who knows what else. You also have, um, notice that souls of men down at the end. I think that's pretty significant also. We need to understand that we're talking here about souls, lost souls, who are slaves of the New World Order, or slaves of, of their economic circumstances, or slaves of rulers. You know, some countries make their citizens pretty much slaves. Uh, strong communist countries are that way, for instance. And sometimes they're also not only slaves, but they're economically challenged as well. Those things go together. 
And when we hear about um, wealth redistribution, when the Pope talks about wealth redistribution, he's talking about it on a global scale, taking money from rich countries and putting it into the hands of poor countries. Does that help the poor countries? No. Does it hurt the rich countries? Yes. But it brings everybody down to a more common level, except the very super rich, you know, and those, the super rich have their role to play as well. Uh, I might add that um, uh, wealth redistribution on a national level, if President Obama, for instance, talks about wealth redistribution, we're also talking then about taking money from wealthy citizens and giving them to poor citizens. That's what a welfare state is all about. When there are government handouts and government welfare that is handed out like never before, um, uh, that means that they are in the process of taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. Yes, they create money out of thin air, but ultimately it has to be paid for. And guess who gets to pay for it? Those who are more wealthy, especially the middle class. The super rich, they know how to avoid taxes. <laughs> You've probably been reading about that in the press as well in recent times. They know how to avoid taxes. It's the middle class and the upper middle class that gets nailed when it comes to wealth redistribution. Now, um, let's have a look at what the Bible says about globalization by studying the story of the first attempt at globalization in all of history. Genesis chapter 10. Now, most people think that Genesis chapter 10 is a rather boring chapter because it's full of so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -so begat so-and-so and on and on it goes. And it gives us a lot of other geographical information about you know, various regions of the earth. And we need to understand this because it fits into what we're talking about tonight the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. Genesis chapter 10, and we'll begin reading with verse 8. Notice it says that Cush begat Nimrod. And Nimrod began to be a mighty one on the earth. Now, what is a mighty one? Someone who has might is someone who has either military or political power. He began to be a mighty one, and as a mighty one, he was able then to corral the tribes, if you will, and bring them under his control. He began to be a mighty one. Okay? Who are the mighty ones today? Well, we have uh, President Obama. We mentioned him already. He's a mighty one in the earth, that's for sure. When he speaks, people listen. And when he acts, it affects people in some very significant ways. Another mighty one on the earth would be Angela Merkel. Do you know who she is? Angela Merkel is the chancellor of Germany. She's in her third four-year term. If she gets one more four-year term, she'll be... Um, on, on, uh, she'll tie with Conrad Adenauer, who was the first chancellor of the Federal Republic after uh, the Second World War. She'll be tied with him if she gets one more term. She has about two years left on this term, and then, well, we'll see what happens. Her political fortunes can go up and down, but I'm telling you what, she is one shrewd woman. And she understands the political nature of the world in which we live. And she knows how to work it. I've been watching her for a while. She's an interesting one. <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see who her successor is, too, by the way. I don't know when or how that will be, but there are some very interesting people in Europe, in Germany, who are, shall I say, in the wings, <laughs> and they're starting to reveal themselves in certain ways. So I don't know what that means as far as who might be the next chancellor, but uh, it could still be another term for Angela Merkel. She may want to carry on. She certainly has power. She's a mighty one on the earth. Then there's Vladimir. Vladimir Putin. He's a mighty one on the earth, isn't he? 
Um, well, there are many others we could talk about. We could, of course, go through quite a list, <clears throat> but that isn't necessary. Mighty ones rule. Now, Nimrod had ambitions. Um, he was a prince, and globalization was his goal. He wanted a new world order, a new world order that was not in harmony with God's plan. In fact, he is a descendant of Ham. Ham's family lived with Shem and Japheth for a while after the flood. But sooner or later, they began to feel uncomfortable staying with their godly brothers. And they wanted to go off on their own. And so that's what they did. And instead of scattering to replenish the earth, as God had instructed, they decided that they would congregate together, as uh, you will see. It says in verse 9 that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Um, now, this is a term before, the word before in the Septuagint is actually translated as against the Lord. In other words, he was doing everything he could to take people away from God. He became the founder of all pagan religion. He pressured his neighbors to adopt heathen practices. And friends, globalization is against the Lord because it is designed to ultimately corral everyone into a certain worship principle at the end of time. It is against God and it's against God's plan, as you'll see. Um, world government is not going to benefit the human race. It leads to persecution and intolerance of the worshipers of God. Come over to verse 10. It says, In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. These were four big cities. Notice that it was the beginning of his kingdom. He had plans. He had quite a, 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 an ambitious plan to establish large cities all over, if he could. And he had colleagues to help him. Um, but the beginning of his kingdom were, the, were these four cities, and Babel was to be his, his palace, or where his palace and his throne was, so that he would then rule from Babel. Then in verse 11, verse 11, it says, Out of that land went forth Asher. Asher is the English name for Assyria. In many other language Bibles, you'll read the term or the name Asher. Asher... Uh, builded Nineveh, and Rehoboth, and Cala, verse 12, and Rezin between Nineveh and Cala, the same is a great city. So they built this series of cities. So how many cities did uh, Asher build? Four big cities. It says it's a great city. I think that's very interesting. It's a great city, that one Cala, or sorry, uh, Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Cala. Great city, that means a big city, a powerful city. And it's very interesting, interesting that in the last days, there is one city that is the spiritual antagonistic uh, entity to God's people. It is a city that is on seven hills. It is a city... Uh, once again, that is used to control or persecute God's people. There's a very interesting statement in Patriarchs and Prophets, which I'd like for you to hear. It's in page 118, Patriarchs and Prophets. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth, to replenish and subdue it. These Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the what? The whole earth. Now that's another term. A monarchy that would embrace the whole earth. She's talking about globalization. 
Nimrod's plan was to control the whole earth and enforce a one world religion. So it says then that Asher went out and built four cities. Um, and then in verse 15, we read about Canaan. Um, it says, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. Sidon was the name of his firstborn son, and he named a city after his firstborn son. All right? And we read about this city in history. If you come all the way down to the time of um, Ahab and Jezebel in Israel, you remember that Elijah went to a certain place. Do you remember the name of the city where Elijah went? Zarephath. Remember Zarephath? It says in the Bible that it belongeth to Zidon, which is Sidon. It's in that Phoenician uh, nation there along the border of Israel. Now, come over to verse 19. Let me show you this. Moses, as it were, takes us on a journey. You know, he takes us on a tour. You ever been on a tour bus? And you go from place to place and and, and visit different places in the tour bus? Well, it's like we're in a tour bus with Moses. And he takes us from one city to the next. Watch this. Verse 19, it says, The border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, which was named after his firstborn son, as thou comest. So you go from Sidon, then you come to Gerar. Okay, that's count the cities here. That's two, right? And then after that, it says, unto Gaza. We still have Gaza today, don't we? There's three cities. All right. And after Gaza, as thou goest. All right. So we're going to keep on going, he says. Go as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah. How many cities now? Five. All right. And Adma and Zeboam and Lasha. How many cities altogether? Eight cities that Canaan built. Isn't that interesting? Globalists are very interested in the usefulness of the city. We have 16 cities here. Four by Nimrod, four by Asher, and eight by Canaan. That's 16. The cities are very useful to globalists. Why? This is a very important question. Why? If we're going to study and understand God's Word for these last days, we need to study and think about what this is saying. You know, a lot of times we read the Bible and we just sort of let it come in the mind and then let it go out again. We don't meditate upon the Word of God. It's very important to meditate on the Bible because the Bible will reveal things to us through the Holy Spirit. As you meditate on the words of Scripture, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and help you understand what He's really saying. Here are these 16 cities. The cities are useful to globalists. Why? What can you do in the city that you can't do in the country so well? You can't. You control them, that's right. You can control where they live. You can control where they work. You can control where they shop. You can control how they get their utilities. You can even control where they worship. All by zoning laws and regulations. Do you have any of those here? Do you have zoning laws? Yes, there's even zoning laws in the country, but usually zoning laws in the country are far less restrictive, far more flexible than they are in the city. Cities are very useful because they can control populations. And that's what Nimrod understood about cities. You see, Nimrod's idea was that there was strength in numbers. Have you ever heard that concept before? Strength in numbers? Do you have strength in numbers? Well, there can be in certain ways. But friends, the way Nimrod saw it was that there was strength in numbers in defying God. He was determined to lead the people in a way that was contrary to God's plan. And so he wanted strength in numbers so that maybe God wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to overthrow them. Of course, God is bigger than that, isn't He? 
We have a big God and God knows exactly what's best and how to manage everything. But the thing about it is cities are designed for strength in numbers, but actually they become very weak. The fact is that cities become very weak. How long can you survive in a city when there is a famine and trucks can't bring food into the city? <laughs> three days, that's right. It's, most cities have a three-day supply of food on the supermarket shelves. That's it. And if there is a serious problem, like in New York City or Los Angeles or some of these great big cities of our nation and cities of other nations, whether it's Melbourne, Australia or Frankfurt, Germany or wherever it is, if the trucks can't get the food into the city or if airplanes can't fly it into the airports, they've got three days and that's it. And I'll guarantee you that once a crisis arises, the shelves are empty in a matter of hours, <laughs> you know, uh, because of the crisis or the panic, I should say, that arises from it. Do you remember when there was a volcano in Iceland that, that shut down the airspace all over Europe? Where does Europe get most of its produce from? Uh, does anybody know where Europe gets its produce from? Europe gets its produce primarily from North Africa and also from Spain. But to get it all the way up to the north part, they have to truck it or fly it. If there's a fuel crisis, if there's a natural disaster, if there's some other kind of problem, people very quickly run out of food and they panic. Oh, friends, God tells us it's better not to live in the city, doesn't he? And there's a good reason for it because the city is where the spiritual pressure is going to come. And by the way, the cities are also where, well, they are the targets of war, terrorism, and natural disasters. That's the way it is. Cities are the targets. And if you live in a city, you become caught up in the maelstrom of crises. Think about those people who are living in Baltimore. They couldn't help it. All of a sudden, they were in the midst of violence. All they could do is go in their homes and just stay put, lock the doors and close the bars up on the windows and whatever else. Try to be as secure as they could. Stay out of the way. There was strength in numbers in his mind, and of course that doesn't um, play out that way. Also, apostasy loves company and assistance. <laughs> Nimrod wanted help with his rebellion to God. So he created cities so that there would be a lot of people around to help him with this. Thirdly, securities provide, uh, sorry, cities provide security and protection. Security and protection. This was one of Nimrod's primary goals in establishing big cities was so that he could have security and protection. But do, does, do cities really provide security and protection? When people get so concentrated together, they get, you know, they get onto each other. They, they start, well, violence becomes an issue. So they're not as protected as you might think. But Nimrod's aim was to protect it on a global scale. In other words, from God's judgments and natural disasters, that sort of thing. So the cities are very useful. But when there's a crisis, cities can also be locked down. You know what that means to lock down a city? That means you can't come in and you can't go out. Friends, I don't want to be in a city when it's locked down. I lose my freedoms. What happened to those people in Boston, uh, was it a year or two ago, when, um, when they were hunting down that fugitive? They locked down the city. The people were told they had to stay in their homes. They were restricted. They could not move. They did not have their freedoms. Not only that, they lost their civil rights and their constitutional protections. 
when that happened. Also think about uh, places like New Orleans under Hurricane Katrina. New York City on 9-11 and afterwards. And New York City with Hurricane Sandy. Remember that? What happened there? The whole lower Manhattan got flooded. How about port au prince when there was a major earthquake that came and destroyed the city. Now we have another pair of earthquakes. It's interesting that the Ellen White speaks of disasters in rapid succession. And we just had two earthquakes in Nepal, one today or yesterday, and one a few days ago, a couple weeks ago, actually. Um, then there was the uh, tsunami in Banda Acha in Indonesia, just wiped out the whole city. Things can happen that are pretty serious in a city. And they're not the protection that people think they are. I had one lady tell me once that she was living in Washington, D.C. and that she just loved the city because it was all this, there was all this culture and there was all this great um, opportunities and things like that. She was at, the, at that point in time, she was a flight attendant and I happened to have some conversations with her one day as, um, as I was traveling and um, I thought to myself, how can I help this woman? <laughs> and I, I was sitting in my seat and, and it was one of those wide body planes with two aisles, you know, and, and we got to Washington Dulles Airport and landed and, and I'm still thinking, how can I, how can I make, a, I've made a good friendship now, how can I make a connection at the spiritual level? Well, I made a mistake. <laughs> thank, thank God it didn't have any serious consequences. But I, I went up to, the, to go out of the plane. I was on the right-hand side, so I had to cross over both aisles into the left-hand side. See? And just as I was getting ready to go out the door, there she was standing there with a couple of pilots um, just talking as people were getting off the plane. I said... And she bent over and listened. I said, I have a little advice for you. She said, what's that? I said, get out of the city. <laughs> she said, why? I said, some terrible things are going to happen in the cities. And then the pilots wanted to get off and I had to get out of the way. So I couldn't explain myself. And so I got outside of the aircraft. I thought to myself, this is really bad. She's got my details. She could even turn me into the, uh, you know, the security organization. Maybe I know something I shouldn't know or, or whatever. Maybe I'm involved or whatever. So I thought I better hold back and uh, just make sure she gets the right idea. So um, after a while, they came off the plane and she caught up to me as I was sauntering along. And she says, oh, there you are. And I came over to her and, I, and she said, you freaked me out. <laughs> That's the mistake, you see. I shouldn't have done it that way, perhaps. But anyway, I said, well, I said, let me tell you who I am. I said, I'm a pastor and I preach on prophecy. And the Bible tells us there's a lot of things going to happen that aren't very nice in the city. And you're better off living in the countryside. And she says, oh, okay. And we talk, 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 talk. She had lots of questions. And we talk, 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 talk. We were good friends, actually all the way out to the shuttle buses where we would, you know, go our separate ways. She was going to an employee parking lot and I was going to my parking lot to take, get my car. And you know, we were talking so much that when I sat down in my shuttle, I suddenly realized what a fool I'd been. I had failed to offer her something to read spiritual. And I started kicking myself and reproving myself for this. And as I sat there in the van, I told the Lord, I had a prayer right there in the van. I told the Lord, Lord, if I ever see her again, and I do see some flight attendants on a regular basis. <laughs> I said, if I ever see her again, I said, Lord, I promise you, I will offer her a copy of the book, Great Controversy. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, the next Sunday I was coming back from none other than Modesto, California. <laughs> My flight had been canceled 
uh, from San Francisco back to Washington for whatever reason, and they'd put me on another flight. And I was kind of not all that happy about it because, you know, I was in a bad seat. You know, I was cramped in a corner at the bulkhead, and I don't like bulkheads because you can't stick your feet out, you know. I'd rather be in a, you know, crowded seat in the back where I can stick my feet under the seat in front, you know. But anyway, anyway, I was in a bad seat, so I was kind of grizzling about that. And, but I came on the plane when they were boarding, and you had to, again, it was another wide body, and you had to walk through first class back to the economy section. And as I walked through first class, there she was. And all of a sudden, I realized why my flight had been canceled. And I tapped her on the shoulder, because she didn't see me. I tapped her on the shoulder. She says, oh, there you are. She said, you fly more than I do. I said, probably I do. So I, I, I sat down in my seat. And about two hours into the flight, I couldn't stand to sit there any longer. I said, I'm going to go see if I can talk to this woman. So, you know, just make more of a friendship. So I went into the toilet. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. And, and I came out, and I looked in the front, and I looked in the back, and I noticed that there was nobody in the middle galley. Nobody. Because the flight attendant, you know, they don't like you to go forward. She was serving first class. And there was business class and then economy. And, you know, they don't like you to go ahead of your cabin. So, but I looked into the galley, and there was nobody in the galley in the front, uh, in the middle. And the light was on up in the front, but it was a dark flight uh, in first class because everybody was sleeping. It services a lot of people coming in from Asia, going back to their various other places. Well, anyway, um, uh, and then I noticed all the flight attendants were having something of a party in the back galley, all the way in the back. I thought, oh, here's my chance. Thank you, Lord. I made a beeline for first class, and there she was. She says, oh, how are you doing? I said, I'm bored to death, and I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> so we sat there, we stood there, rather, and talked for two hours. Two hours. I had the privilege to talk to her about the book Great Controversy. She wanted to know what a Seventh-day Adventist was, and I explained that to her. She wanted to understand a little bit about diet and health. I explained some things to her about diet and health. And, uh, but then she said, now, so then I said, okay, I've got to fulfill my promise to the Lord. So I said, I have a book that you might like to read. She happened to be from France. And she, I said, I have a book you might like to read. She says, is it big? She says, I don't like big books. I can't ever get through them. I said, well, it's a little big. I said, but there's two chapters you should read. There's one on the French Reformation and one on the French Revolution. And I said, you should read those first and then just read the last 200 pages. That'll tell you what's coming in the future. She says, okay, all right. She said, I'll take it. I didn't have it with me. I'd have to mail it to her. So she got up the courage to give me her address in Washington, D.C., and I mailed her a copy of the book. I don't know where that's at and where it's going to go. She was a very secular woman, but um, by the grace of God, the seeds have been dropped so that she will sense the call of God, not only to come out of the city, but to come out of Babylon Amen. and all false religion. You know, you can witness for your faith. And let's perhaps just tie this in here because you can witness easily. I think many people are afraid to witness because they're afraid of rejection or they're afraid of this or that or whatever. All you got to do, friends, is a, there's a secret to it. All you have to do is talk to people about their family. They love to talk about their kids and their grandkids. And then you can talk to them about their health. They love to give you an organ recital. <laughs> and you can talk to them about their work. You know, they love to tell you what a hero they are at work. But, you know, all those things, you know, lead you to the point where you're asking them questions. Sooner or later, they're going to ask you the same questions. And guess what that does? When someone asks you a question, they've given you permission to answer it. And the answer can be as abbreviated or as expanded as is necessary, you know. And you have permission to do it.
I don't know how many times I've gotten into conversation with people that has been absolutely amazing. It's easy to do. And you can go right from there into prophecy. You can go into all manner of things. And I love to talk to people about globalization and politics and these sorts. They love to talk about politics. But I like to take them beyond the normal politics because the Bible tells us how to understand them. You know, if, if you don't understand the Bible, uh, you will not understand the big picture of what's going on. You may remember that Jesus told, or rather there's a story, I should say, about Jesus where he healed a blind man. He touched this blind man's eyes and he said, what do you see? And the blind man said, I see men like trees walking. So Jesus touched his eyes again. And then he said, it says he could see all men clearly. Let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus have to touch his eyes twice? Couldn't he have just healed his eyes the first time? Of course. There's a reason why Jesus touched his eyes twice. It's a reason so that we may understand something about people out there. You see, current events, whether it's natural disasters, political things, uh, uh, violence, uh, Islamic State, whatever it is, these things have people paying attention. But they just see men like trees walking. They cannot see it clearly. God is setting them up so that you can be the second touch of Jesus on the eyes of the blind, the spiritually blind brothers and sisters. Don't you think that's important? Amen. Friends, as we come down to the end of time and we come down to globalization in the last days, let me read you this final statement from Country Living, page 17 and 18. Serious times are before us. And there is great need for families to get out of the cities into the country that the truth may be carried into the byways as well as the highways of the earth. Much depends upon laying our plans according to the word of the Lord and with persevering energy carrying them out. More depends on consecrated activity and perseverance than upon genius and book learning. Well, you know more than they do, so you don't have to worry. All the talents and ability given to human agents, if unused, are of little value. So you have to use what God has given you, my friends. And that's very important. Now may God bless each of you as we come to a conclusion of our first session tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for revealing in your word these wonderful things. Bless us, we pray, and keep us by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.